This is the Hockey Podcast Network, your home for hockey talk on every team in the NHL. And the Norris Trophy goes to Mark Giordano. Jerome McGinley's mom, 500 goals. Up in center and coming in as Lowe. Bill Dyke centered it. Murray gets it again. That's the shot by Snow falling, hockey under the lights, a Canadian rivalry on a Saturday night. Man, could it be any better than that? I am Brad Root, host of Flames Unfiltered, episode number nine. And tonight, we get to talk Heritage Classic. Like, Does it get any better than that? What a great event. What a great event for the players and their families and the fans. And I was, I don't know, I'm not like an outdoor hockey Fan. I guess I like the first few winter classics, and then after that, it was like, all right, enough, move on. I think it's overdone. But I'll tell you what, I really like this one. And not just because the Flames are in it, but just, you know what? I think what it was is because was it was in Regina. Regina is a great city, man. I love Regina. They did a great job. First class. It was just a good hockey game all around. You couldn't have scripted it any better except for the score, maybe, huh? God, you know, when we went eight minutes without a stoppage in the third, I thought, man, this is great for the Flames. And then I'm like, oh, shoot, here we go. But anyways, great, great, great event. Love the Heritage Classic. We're going to talk about that a lot more in this episode. Flames head on a road trip, four-game East Coast roadie. Boy, is it important. What do we think? What has it got to be for us to say, you know what, that was successful? What has it got to be? Is it two and two? Five points? I don't know. It's time to get things going, though, Calgary. We had a lot of fun at the Heritage Classic. Great event. Now it's time to start putting up some points. Today on the show, we're going to recap the Florida game. We're going to dive deeply into the Heritage Classic. Then we have a special guest today on the show as Connor Farrell from Grit 60 Podcast joins us. And then we're going to roll into some Flames news, talk some injuries, Harvey's doghouse, fan question, an interesting one today. And then we're going to preview the game coming up in Carolina. It is Flames Unfiltered. I am the host of the show, Brad Brood. NHL news, opinions, and controversy. All right, let's recap some hockey. We're not going to recap the Winnipeg Calgary game right now. We're going to roll into that in just a few minutes. But first, we're going to talk Florida Calgary Thursday night, October twenty fourth. The Florida Panthers came to town, and I don't know. I thought this was going to be. Not easy, I guess, but not as crazy as it was. I mean, Florida's a lot better hockey team now, but they are letting in goals at a higher rate than they want to be. Let's just put it that way. Calgary escapes this one. (laughs) 6-5 in a shootout. And maybe I'm just a little taken aback because of the lead we had. But let's talk that. First period, after one, one nothing. Zarna gets his second of the year. Bad news is he gets injured shortly after scoring that goal. After two, or 2-2, two, two, Kachuk gets his third of the year. Kachuk was really good in this game, too. 2-2 two, two after two, I thought, eh, things are looking all right. Then we are in for a wild and crazy one. And Calgary jumps right out in the third, gets two goals, one from Kachuk, his second of the night. And Captain Geo gets a goal. And we're up 4-2, and I'm thinking, hmm, all right, here we go. We got the offense rolling. We got things rolling. Everybody's looking pretty good for the most part. And then Florida races back with three unanswered. And it was like, oh, here we go. Now we're down. Didn't expect to be down in this one like this, especially when we were just up 
four to two. So things are not looking quite as good. Then Sam Bennett to the rescue. He ties it up at the 17-17 mark. Nobody scores in overtime. We go to a shootout. Monahan and Kachuk, two nice, nice shootout goals. Riddick got that monkey off his back a couple weeks ago in the shootouts. Does it again. Flames win 6-5. Kachuk, Bennett, Giordano had great nights. And I don't really have, I know some people think I'm negative all the time. I don't really have anything bad to say about anybody. I didn't think anybody was horrible. Let's put it that way. I didn't think anybody was horrible. So, we escape. We get two points. We had to give a point. Didn't really matter, though, because it is an Eastern team. So, I guess if you're going to give a point, give go to overtime. I guess it's okay in that one. 6-5 win, two points for Calgary against Florida. Now it's time to head to the Heritage Classic. Every team, everywhere. The Hockey Podcast Network. Let's talk Heritage Classic, and let's review it. Saturday night, October 26th, Mosaic Stadium in Regina. What a setting. What a setting. Let's talk the game first, and then we'll roll into uh, my favorite parts of the night. First period, nobody scores. Winnipeg out shoots Calgary 14-11. I thought the first period was really back and forth. Seemed to me like a lot of guys were falling. Everybody said the ice was good, though. Snow continued heavily in the second. I shouldn't say heavily. Pretty strong, I guess, in the second. Calgary takes two penalties right away. Bennett gets called for a interference or tripping on the goalie, which was complete garbage because it was a jet stick that actually flipped Hellebuck. Bennett goes to the penalty box. Calgary kills it off. Thank goodness. Calgary goes on to the power play, and Lindholm gets a goal on a nice pass from Goudreau right in the slot. And then the controversy happens. The Jets go to replay. They call for an instant replay on whether Matthew Kachuk high-sticked it to keep the puck in the zone up by the blue line. I personally thought it was a high stick. It looked like a high stick. I can't believe they didn't whistle it down. But we got screwed on a high stick in game one of the year against Colorado, and the hockey gods got us back on this one. It went to replay. They said that they could not conclusively determine that the puck was over the shoulders because Kachuk was bent over slightly and there was no area in the video that could show a reference point. I don't know. I think they got this wrong. They said that they looked at it in-house instead of Toronto. I'm not sure why. But anyways, goal stands. Winnipeg gets a penalty. Winnipeg was irate and probably had good reason to be. Then at the end of the second period with a score one to nothing still, Oliver Shillington gets drilled from behind at the buzzer from Lowry, and it was a dirty, dirty hit. There's going to be a hearing on Monday on this one. I don't think there'll be a suspension. And the reason I don't think there will be is because Shillington came back in the game. Shillington doesn't come back in this game. There's a definite suspension, which I don't think they should be basing suspension solely on how long a guy's injured. This was a blatant, blatant run from behind into the numbers, and it looked bad. It looked really bad. So let's see how the NHL does. Let's see if they get this right. Thank goodness our young defenseman Shillington is okay. Third period. Fast forward this third period. No whistle the first eight minutes, and as that happened, I thought, huh, this is good for the Flames. We're up one nothing. That's just rolling that period off. Things are good. Then it happens. With Giordano in the penalty box, Morrissey ties the game on a power play slap shot. It was a blast. Beauty off the post. We are not at one. Play continues through the third period. Lots of scoring chances for a 1-1 game. I thought there was quite a few scoring chances. Shots after three were 41-30. In favor of Winnipeg. On overtime, Monaghan takes a tripping penalty. Early in overtime, Calgary kills it off. Scoring chances, Jets had a few in that. Then a faceoff in Winnipeg zone. And it looked like Derek Ryan and Matthew Kachuk just fell asleep. Jets win the faceoff, chip it up, and it creates a two-on-one. 
And it just looked like there was a miscommunication between Ryan and Kachuk on who was going to grab who. And two-on-one, little scores, game over, two-to-one Jets. Now, as frustrating as it is, we get one point, but I feel like we gave one away in this one. I thought, for the most part, it was a back-and-forth game. We did get outshot pretty handily, and that is a topic that I want to talk about. We are giving up way, way too many shots this year. It's just crazy how many shots we're giving up. And we need to figure this one out because you just can't continue to give up shots at this rate and be okay. It's just not going to happen. So we need to figure out why we're giving up this many shots and button down. But let's talk on the positives. This was a great game. What a great atmosphere. Regina did such a good job. Having the snow falling was amazing. I thought it was piling up pretty good on the ice. Players did not complain about it. Both Matthew Kachuk and Brian Little said it was great. They could have cared less. I did see it hang up in the the puck one time on Gaudreau really bad. But you know what? I'll trade that any day. The snow was fun. It made it even more of a great atmosphere. The intro was the was amazing with the players coming out. And the, and the Mounties and the military and the flyover was just super loud. Loudest flyover I've ever heard. I thought it was a great game. I'm not an outdoor guy, but I loved it. Favorite, favorite, favorite parts. Jerseys. Could you get any better for jerseys? Wow. I love that flame jersey. And I really like the Jets ones too. They were great. I love the snow. I love the pregame. All of it. Top-notch job by Regina. Power performers for the Flames, I thought Lindholm and Shillington were really good. Didn't like the play of Lucic. I don't even know. Should I even put him on my negatives anymore? Because I just I think this is what we're going to get, and this is what we're going to have to deal with. What a Heritage Classic. Couldn't get any better. Lots and lots of fun. Inside Edge Hockey News. Bringing you inside the game. Now we'd like to welcome Connor Farrell in. From Grit 60 Podcast, you can hear that podcast on the Hockey Podcast Network. Great to have you on the show, Connor. Heritage Classic last night, real fun event. Mm-hmm. What were your some of your favorite parts? You know, as a Winnipeg Jets guy, what, what were your some of your favorite parts of the event? Um, well, you know, you got to throw in the, the game winner at the end there. That has to be part of the, uh, uh, you know, favorite moments from the night. Um, you know, um, I guess it's good to see the power play doing their thing for once this season. It's been a struggle. And, you know, Connor Hellebuck has just been a joy to watch. So uh, those are some highlights for me. Yeah, Connor Hellebuck definitely is a fun goalie to watch. I, You know, it's kind of funny. You know, being a Calgary Flames guy, you find your teams you really like to watch your favorite team play against. And Winnipeg is one of uh, – one of my favorite teams to have the Flames play against, and Connor Hellebuck just a is a great goalie and a fun and a lot of fun to watch. But outdoor games, you know, pretty yeah. new to pretty new to Calgary. Uh, it's only their second one. Winnipeg, I believe it's only their second one too, but they had one just a couple years ago. How do you like outdoor games? I, you know, growing up in Florida, uh, kind of a <laughs> a shift of pace for me, so I find it interesting, find it entertaining. Uh, just because it's not not really uh, uh, something I experienced growing up, um, but it, it is it is you know it can be at times overplayed a little bit in the NHL. The more and more we see these outdoor games, sort of the less special it become becomes. But I still always have fun with it. You know, I, I I couldn't agree with you more. I think they are becoming less and less special. And as I sat last night and watched the game, I thought, hmm, would I be watching this game? If it was uh, Vancouver, L.A., probably not. No. But you know, since well, was, Vancouver and L.A. aren't. I might, I might watch that because fun it's, team. Yeah, because Vancouver is a fun team to watch, and 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 actually, as poor as L.A. has been, they they're a pretty entertaining team to watch this year. But um, you know, I was just thinking, you know, if this was outside my you know, network of Calgary, right. would I, would I be paying as much attention? Now I live just five hours away from Winnipeg. So have in, in just three and a half hours from Regina. So having this outdoor in a setting, Canadian Prairie setting, snow falling, boy, I don't think we could have asked for anything more. No, it was, it was, a, it was a 
fun night. And, and you know, it, it's interesting to think about would I be watching this if, if my team weren't on? And I think the answer is probably no. But at the same time, I think every fan should experience this once. I, I think it's fun for the, the fans of those individual teams to try to experience this. So I think in that regard, it is pretty special. With it being, you know, so picturesque, I, you know, I, I, I go back to when it was Buffalo and, and Sidney Crosby in the first winter classic and the snow falling down and, you know, that Buffalo – Pittsburgh battle that went to a shootout and I think we remember that as much for the snow falling as we do the game itself and last night I think if you were a hockey fan and you were flipping through the games which there was a lot of good hockey games on last night yeah. and if you were flipping through and you saw it was snow and you just it was would have been pretty hard to not stop and and give it a good watch but yeah a lot more snow than I expected when I looked at the forecast and everything and do you think that negatively affected the play I, from watching the game, I don't think so. I think maybe it made it a little less smooth, but at the same time, I thought both teams really did a good job of playing through it and, like, maintaining that energy, maintaining that intensity. Uh, you know, we saw a bunch of different chances at both ends um, being created, I thought. Um, maybe not so much converting, because I thought both goalies played an outstanding game. Um, but I didn't, I don't think... I don't think it slowed the game down very much. I think it affected the game, but I don't think it, it deteriorated the level of play. You know, I think I would agree with that. I think, you know, both Matthew Kachuk and Brian Little both stated that uh, it didn't bother them and they loved it. Um, I did think it got a little choppy at times where um, I know there was one time Gaudreau got the puck stuck mm -hmm. and you could see it stick in the snow. And I mean, but that's part of it. Both teams are playing on that. So I don't think it, yeah. I, I don't know. I guess if I had my choice to watch it, snowing or not snowing last night I'd, I'd pick the snowing I think it was a pretty you know fun yeah. part of the game and you're right you made a great comment with you know with Riddick and Hellebuck both having really really good nights and for a low scoring game there was a lot of excitement and a lot of scoring chances. oh yeah oh yeah a lot so of scoring back and forth oh sorry oh you're fine no it's it there was there was a lot of chances I mean in every period each team had a couple point blank shots that goalies had to make big saves on and um I thought there was a lot of excitement. There was a little bit of chippiness, a little bit of rough stuff. A little uh, bit, yeah. I, I thought it, the game kind of had a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. A little bit of everything. Some power play goals, some penalties, some long stretches of five-on-five -five time, some long stretches of play without an interruption, good goaltending, a little bit of, like you said, a mix, some overtime action, a little bit of a mixed bag there. Yeah, it definitely it had it all, and it was sure a fun, sure a fun, fun event. Jets big win. I mean, that is a big win big for win. the Winnipeg Jets. Now, yeah. is this a win with the setting and the event that it was? Is this something this team can build upon and get this team on track? I think it, I mean, it's certainly, it's too early to tell, uh, but I certainly think it has that potential um, because this is, one of those, I mean, if you look at the way the Jets have been playing recently, they haven't generated a whole lot of offense. In particular, I think they've, you know, they've gone up, they had this long um, homestand, and I think their last win was a two win, two one, or maybe it was a one nothing overtime victory over the um, Oilers. Um, and, you know, they, they, as I said on the Grip for 60 podcast, um, we were talking about this game, and I was saying, hey, this Calgary Flames team, they're a good team. They've got a lot of talent, and the Jets played them really, really hard. Um, so it's certainly something you can look and I, I think, you know, we look, talk about how there wasn't a whole lot of scoring in this game, but both teams created a bunch of chances. And I think the process is there for this team to certainly open the floodgates against somebody and to really start to build on this. There's a lot of good things that came out of this game, even though the scoreline was only two, one, there was still a lot of different things. Like Jack Roslevic is one of those guys that I'm going to point out and say, he had a stellar game last night. He didn't score, but he created two goal-scoring opportunities that could have gone in on another night. You know, I, I look at this Winnipeg Jets team, and it, it, it's a team that scares the heck out of me. Um, I really think this is a good hockey team, and I know there's been you know a ton of negative talk towards Winnipeg this year because their defense has just been decimated with free mm -hmm. agency and trades and salary cap problems and then Dustin Bufflin not showing. And I, 
I don't know. I think a lot of teams are going to sleep on Winnipeg this year, and Winnipeg is going to. I I look at this as a as a a stepping stone for Winnipeg, and I look for this team to really kind of take off. I I, I had them making the playoffs in my predictions, and I think I think Winnipeg's a really good hockey team. They have their top six forwards. Any team in the league would yeah. die to have these top six. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, what's super, super important is that top six, as you, you mentioned. Um, and it, going back to what I was saying earlier, how they've been struggling in the, over this homestand that they've had, um, a lot of the struggles that we look at is that that top six hasn't been on the score sheet. And with the, the, as you mentioned, the defense behind them isn't – they're not your ideal – top or you're the, not your ideal defensive core, uh, particularly with buff kind of figuring out what he's doing. Um, but there is a lot of potential, a lot of promise on this team, but it has to start with the guys like Shifley, Connor, uh, little coming back from and little had the goal. So that's good for him. Um, wheelers. I, in my opinion, has had a really slow start to this season. Um, guys like that need to step up and start scoring games because we can't, win one nothing games, two one games consistently with this, you know, defense. Even as good as Connor Hellebuck is playing, the guys on this defense, I mean, you've got Josh Morrissey and, you know, a, a bunch of other guys that are, aren't great defensively. Now, they have a lot of skill back there. Hanela is fantastic. Uh, Neil Pionk has got great skill, but these are guys that are going to be more offensively minded. It's part of that puck moving defenseman that are starting to crop into this league. Morrissey's really your only shut down defenseman on that blue line. Um, and that's going to be problematic if you can only score one or two goals a game. So hopefully moving forward, they get on the board, they get some more on the board. And I think they do have the pieces there. You know, Shifley, obvious Kyle Connor's got some assists. Maybe he can translate that into goals at some point. Uh, Nikolai Ehlers has looked fantastic. Andrew Kopp has really, we thought he was going to be a fourth line center. He had to step in for Brian Little when he was hurt. He could play in that second line center role if he had to. He's really stepped up this uh, season. And Jack Russell, like, is, I, to me, is just, I'm just waiting for him to start tallying points. It's funny how in Winnipeg, you know, you got like guys like Kopp and things like that to just kind of come out of nowhere and emerge onto the scene mm-hmm. and, and turn into great, great hockey players. You know, you mentioned Blake Wheeler and, he has looked extremely frustrated in this last couple of weeks. And, and, you know, with this victory and the way it all went down, you know, maybe this will get him on track too and, and, and kind of have an attitude change in the room. But Blake Wheeler has definitely been frustrated with his slow start. And and as a Jets guy, I'm sure you're happy to see his frustration because that really shows he cares. Yeah, you can see, I mean, you can. he definitely wears his emotions a little bit. But I don't. I don't think his frustration has really has negatively affected his game. At least, um, I just think you know he's kind of part of that that group that's doing the things well. That you're like, okay, these should translate to points at some point, and they just haven't gone his way yet. So I'm looking for him to kind of turn the corner a little bit here soon, and hopefully, him and Shifley in particular get on that same page that they we know they can be. You know, it's kind of funny, you know, the, with the way the Winnipeg Jets' top six has struggled a little bit. And you correlate that over to the Calgary Flames, and it's kind of mirror image. The top mm-hmm. six on Calgary has really, really struggled out of the gates this year. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why Calgary is off track right now is that when you're not getting production from your big guys like Gaudreau and Monaghan or vice versa, you know, Shifley and Wheeler for the Jets, your team's not going to be going. It's just the way the NHL is now. You have to get top production top production from your key players. Yeah. And I, they mentioned on the broadcast, how the flames sort of threw their forwards in a blender, like right before the game or coming into the game. And I, I almost have to wonder how long um, the jets wait until how long they can say, okay, we're only scoring one or two goals a game. Okay. Now we have to make some drastic changes here. And we've already seen some, fluidity within those lines. Uh, Eller is playing on that top line for a while before uh, Line A got into form, and now Line A is playing on that top line. Uh, Kyle Connor coming down onto the second line, that sort of thing. But how long until we really start to see a, a massive shakeup there? Um, it's going to be 
a question for the Jets coming forward. Paul Maurice actually kind of hinted about that last night in his post game interview on uh, CBC that uh, he uh, may just be doing some tweaking if things don't pick up on the offensive side. Mm-hmm. One final question for you, Connor, and I will let you get on with your evening. But Dustin Bufflin still not in I, with the team. Um, his future up in the air. Where? What are your thoughts on that whole situation? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, I don't have very much of an inside track on the whole Dustin Bufflin situation. I, I would have to say, you know, at some point he has to make a decision one way or another, and it's you know, to make things easier on the um, front office, it should be soon. But even then, at this point, it's like, I guess you could trade assets to bring a defenseman in. Um, but it's not like you can, it's not like it's the summer and you can go get a free agent defenseman, you know? Um, so the timing of everything, the way it's played out where he said, you know, I think it was two weeks before the season started. I, that's already kind of putting some pressure on the front office. That's already trying to deal with camp issues. Yeah. So if we can, you know, if you're, you know, trying to, even if he says, okay, I'm going to retire and suddenly all that cash space is available. I don't know how many different moves are still available to the Jets because really your, your main way of bringing talent in at this point in the season would be to, um, trade for someone and I don't know how many different assets you want to really give up. Uh, particularly we'd have to see how the rest of the season shapes out because the Jets honestly could turn out to be a bubble playoff team. They could be in, they could be out. So they might be looking to make a trade anyway. There's a whole lot of other things to take into consideration. I don't really know how this is going to play out. I almost wonder if Bufflin can, is feeling the, um, uh, the the weight that an NHL season, an NHL career is taken on and say, well, maybe if I can just take a few months off before jumping into the swing of things. And then when things get really important, I can jump in and go on a playoff run or something like to that effect. Um, but it's just an interest. It's just something that I'm trying to keep my eye on. And I don't really have a feel for which way it's going to go one way or the other. It's definitely an interesting topic and, and you know, horrible timing. And, you know, you mentioned him possibly taking that time and then coming back. And I thought about that a lot, too. And I believe he has till mid-December to do so, or is it end of December, one of the two. And I thought, well, how does the team react if he does decide to come back? Like, hey, you left us hanging, yeah. but I, I don't know. It's just going to be a really interesting dynamic and a fun one to see how it plays out. Um, I'm sure the Jets would love to have him back on their back end and uh, would definitely help him as they push to uh, to make the playoffs this year. Yep, absolutely. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a ride the entire way. This central division is not gonna be easy to get into. Well, the Heritage Classic last night, fun game. Winnipeg wins that two to one, and it was just a fun event to to take part in and watch and to have the snow falling and a, and a good good low scoring battle. Thanks for jo- joining me tonight, Connor. Really appreciate it. Check out Grit Sixty no Podcast on the Hockey Podcast Network. Every team, everywhere, the Hawk Podcast Network. Let's talk a little Calgary Flames news and not a whole lot to talk about. We're going on on a big four-game road trip. Some injury news, Zarnik injured in the Florida game, lower body, put on long-term IR, out, looks like a mid-December return from Zarnik. We wish him the best. God, just so frustrating because he was just getting his game going, finally worked his way up to get the opportunity that he had waited for, and then I'll oh, be damned. He gets hurt. Oh, Alan Quine recalled from Stockton to fill his place, and we wish Zarnick the best and hope to see him back as soon as we possibly can. It is our Sunday, our Monday show, and we are going to go into our latest edition of Harvey's Doghouse. We do it every week where we talk about what flame player is getting under our nerve and is who is in the doghouse. This week, I kind of warned on the show last time, Johnny Gaudreau. And you know what? As I did this, I, I've kind of pulled back the reins a little bit. I was really going to let him have it. But you know what? I can't because I did think he was pretty good in the Heritage Classic. I really did. I thought he did all right. And then you look at his numbers, 13 games played. He's got three goals, seven assists, assist, 10 points. That's not so bad, huh? 
Scary part is there's only three assists in his last five games, no goals. Definitely not clipping along at the pace we're used to for Johnny Gaudreau. And, you know, I'm not really sure what it is with the line juggles. He doesn't have Monahan on the side now. Um, I don't know if that's a bad thing. I think that actually might be a good thing. Um, he played with on a line with Lindholm and Kachuk Saturday night, and I thought Gaudreau was one of the better players. So, you know, maybe he's going to work himself out of this. He's got a lot to prove. He's got a lot of pressure on him right now. A lot of people in Calgary not happy with Johnny Hockey, and let's see if he can pull himself out of Harvey's doghouse. On to our fan question. It comes from Medicine Hat, Alberta, from Michelle Waugh, and I like this question. She had a question, what is your favorite and what is your worst Calgary Flames jersey ever? And you know, I loved these jerseys at the Heritage Classic. My favorite Flames jersey is this. I they, they The Heritage Classic were basically the same things as what the Flames were in the 80s when we had our great success and won a Stanley Cup. They are so bright. They are so nice. They just, everything was perfect with them. I love seeing them. I wish we could see them all the time. I wish we could wear these retros all the time. So that is my favorite jersey of all time. The worst jersey. And this one was pretty darn easy. Um, the last Heritage Classic, I believe it was 2011. Those are Ronald McDonald striped jerseys. Yeah, they're bad. Very, very, very bad. Following behind in a close second, and I know a lot of people like these, but I hated those black horse head jerseys that we had as a third jersey years ago. Did not like the horse head jersey either. I pray we never see that thing come back. But I think a lot of us would like to see these white jerseys we saw on Saturday night as our everyday jersey for the road. Game previews. All right. One game to preview, and that is Tuesday night, October 29th. The next time the Flames take the ice, and that'll be in Carolina. Carolina, 7-3-1, 15 points, third in the Metro. Off to a real good start this year. I I kind of dogged on this team earlier in the year, and they're, I knew they were going to prove me wrong. Every time I dog on somebody, they'd prove me wrong. Calgary sits right now 6-5-2, 14 points, fourth in the Pacific and Calgary is coming off that 2-1 to one loss Saturday night to Winnipeg. Carolina coming off a Saturday home victory for nothing over the Chicago Blackhawks. Players that are watching this one, and how could I not? Come on, Cal- Carolina, I've got to go with Dougie Hamilton. Former Calgary Flame, kind of got jettisoned out of Calgary on a bad note. He has six goals, six assists, 12 points in 11 games. Wow, that's damn good. But Dougie Hamilton scored a lot of points in Calgary, but he just had a lot of turnovers, too. That was a bad thing. So let's see how many turnovers Dougie Hamilton can have on Tuesday night and enjoy a Calgary Flames victory. Calgary Flames to watch. Andrew Maggiapani. I don't know what to think of this guy. Two goals, two assists, four four points in 11 games. I don't think that's what we want. And I don't think that's what Andrew Maggiapani wants either. So is this guy for real? Are we going to start seeing points? Are we going to start seeing production out of Andrew Maggiapani? It's time, and it's time to see it starting on Tuesday night in Carolina. Thanks again for tuning in to Flames Unfiltered. I am Brad Brood. I hope you enjoyed the Heritage Classic as much as I did because, boy, Regina, you did a great, great job of hosting. Get connected. Flames Unfiltered can be found on Twitter at Flame Unfiltered. And also make sure you check out our Facebook page at Flames Unfiltered. Check out host Brad Brood on Twitter at Brad Brood. And if you like what you hear, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You can find Flames Unfiltered on all the major podcast players. And consider subscribing to Inside Edge Hockey News on Patreon. That'll get you exclusive content and much more. Thanks again and enjoy the hockey action. Play on! Yeah! Thanks for listening to Flames Unfiltered. Check back for more action-packed Calgary Flames talk. There's all kinds of excitement going on there. Over at the penalty box, Jim Boplitsky and Tim Hunter not dressed tonight and going down McKinnis. They've got their sweats on and the Calgary Flames have won the Stanley Cup. We're the winners! We're the winners! Yeah, baby! Yeah, baby! Yeah, baby! 
You're listening to the Hockey Podcast Network on Twitter at HockeyPodNet. New episodes every Monday and Thursday. Download at the HockeyPodcastNetwork.com or wherever you get your podcasts from. This has been a production of Inside Edge Hockey News Radio, brought to you by the Hockey Podcast Network. This production is copyrighted and distributed by the Inside Edge Hockey Media Group. (laughs) 